Hey guys, so I'm back here at Avian Behavior International. And you know, for all you parrot keepers out there, you know, there's so many questions about their behavior. What does it mean when they do this? What does it mean when they do that? And in this video, we're gonna learn all about parrot behavior. This is Leo, he is a hyacinth macaw. He is eight years old and he is full of personality as you can see. Now, hyacinth macaws have one of the strongest pounds per square inch of pressure bite in all of parrots. Uh, probably second only to um, palm cockatoos. Now, Leo here is pretty amped up. He, he likes all the things that you have going on over Hang there. On. So hyacinth macaws have the strongest uh, bite pressure in parrots pounds per square inch of pressure, uh, second only to the palm cockatoo, which we like to talk about. But one of the biggest problems, whether you have a big parrot like this or a small Arr! parrot, rawr, uh, <laughs> right on cue, uh, even a small parrot like a small conure, cockatiel, Amazon parrots, they all bite, right? Anything with a mouth bites. And that's kind of one of the big issues with parrots overall. People want to step up their parrot. They want to take their parrot out of the case. They want to put their parrot back in the cage. And the parrot is like, I got your number. I know how to say no. And I know how to say no in a way that works. So that's kind of the big things with parrots that, uh, that people often come and seek professional consultation or ask the hive mind, you know, social media about that they get all kinds of different answers about how to solve that problem. And right. you're going to get every different kind of answer for every person that you ask. And that's not always the best. Right, exactly. <laughs> so here at Avian Behavior International, we work with positive reinforcement. And what that really means is creating these like mutually beneficial uh, interactions where we both get what we want out of that. And so Leo is going to get something that he wants pretty much every time that I ask him and that I cue him to step up and or cue him to step down as it were. And that can mean food. It can mean, hey, we're going somewhere that we want. But of course he has to learn that step in a stepwise process. Right. So I use his favorite treats to start and then he can kind of slowly start expecting that I'm, I'm going to have something good every time. And that can mean a stepwise process. So this is really what we teach people. What I'm gonna watch is his body language and you can see he's got all kinds of body language here. But I start with my hand like way out here where he can't even like hurt. And well, he knows this jam, but I know that when he steps up, he's, he's really gonna invite me in. Some parents aren't quite so forgiving, but again, it's really just like creating this relationship where I teach him that every time he steps up or every time he steps down, because that's also what I want him to do, that he gets something. Right. So that's, that's true of whether he's going back into his cage um, in his home environment or onto a perch or something else that I want him to go there. Cause that's really where we see a lot of the bites start to happen. Gotcha. And uh, for everybody wondering what that other sound yeah. is, we've got a bunch of football dinosaurs yeah. running around down here. They know where the treats yeah, that's are right. at. They know, they know <laughs> when it's treat time. Training time is treat time. Roar! Roar! Roar. So it, another thing, uh, as you can see, another big problem with, uh, with parrots is screaming. And it's really helpful that if your parrot has sounds that you like to reinforce those instead of sounds that you don't like and in, you know human sounds are good even little like bops and whistles and anything that you like i'm going to reinforce that with food or i'm going to repeat them like a contact call so that's a really good way of actually teaching your parrot what to do instead of what not to do because if he can get my attention whether it's like he's making a sound from another room uh, with something that I want him to do rather than he screams and I come running in the room like be quiet roar um, Then then he's actually gonna learn like oh that that's that's the button to push and they really learn They're very intelligent and they learn just like kids a temper tantrum You know that gets mom and dad's attention quicker than being good He's making really funny sounds <laughs> is actually the really the way to go and it's really hard It's it's hard for us to flip that switch in our brain right. but that is the really important part of how we can we can train them to make that 
the more appropriate uh, flock sounds in, in this weird little flock that we have going on. So for people that have parrots and, you know, have company over and the parrot doesn't recognize the, the person standing in their house and they start to act up, what's a technique on how to work with that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And I, I really like that question because it is something that happens a lot and we sort of put our value systems on what we want our parrots to do given something that's actually really uncomfortable for them, right? Like strangers coming into their area is like, hey, this is not what I actually want to have happen in a natural right. situation. So I really recommend like a, a two home space scenario. So if you can get your your parrot like a second large play cage that's just as fun and just as engaging, but maybe in like a, a an unused room in the home where it's not like a punishment scenario, but they can go there and have fun right. and and just not be like inundated with friends. And then when when the house is calmed down a little and you can bring your parrot out to, to meet people, but like where it's a little more positive and they can have some privacy, that's really what I recommend because they can get really squawky and start to become what we call sensitized to that scenario and then just become really disruptive. And they can become jealous if they're not the center of attention exactly exactly so they they really start like creating a scenario that's hard to ignore right they can make a lot a lot of racket and then people sort of have to keep doing things like feeding them which is like oh, okay i make this ear splitting scream i press that button and i get something for it and so then they start to associate like a party or someone coming home with make they're not dumb like, right they know right so i really like like a two a two cage setup that um, helps avoid that scenario. You can put them there before the party even starts and they can go there and play and eat and forage and do all these parrot things. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, creating that, that really well ingrained situation. Hi, <laughs> hello. All right, so you have one of my favorite cockatoos here. Yep. This is Jupiter. So Jupiter, so palm cockatoos are famously pretty sensitive birds. And this is Jupiter. He is a very young palm cockatoo. And you can see like when his crest is up, he's actually like pretty like, whoa, what's mm -hmm. going on? And he was also raised very differently than some of my other uh, parrots were because he came from a home where the woman actually passed away and they wanted to make sure that he went to a place that was very knowledgeable on palm cockatoos. Okay. So he has a really specialized diet. These birds have an incredible, like really complicated diet that uh, can be just challenging for your average person. And again, like I said, they can be pretty sensitive. So it was important to a lot of people in the, the woman's life that he came to someone that knew a lot about how to, how to work with them and also just talk about their challenges in the wild in various places throughout Indonesia. So this is Arthur. He is a 20 year old palm cockatoo, maybe even older. He came from a pet store and uh, somewhere in Florida, I'm not exactly sure where, but uh, they tried to get him into a breeding situation because he has really valuable genetics right. and it was very upsetting to him. So he has been sort of recovering from that ever since and is in, a, is in an education facility where he can actually teach people about conservation. He's a really good boy and he's, he's He's kind of been a star, but uh, yeah, he, he is a very, very large palm cockatoo and has a lot to say usually. But as you can see, he's just kind of checking you out. Um, palm cockatoos, their crest up is mean, can mean a lot of different things, but he's just curious. And uh, the, the floof feathers over the, his bottom mandible just are kind of covering up the size of his beak because everything about a palm cockatoo is designed to show you how big their beaks are. And so uh, researchers believe, scientists believe that when they cover up the size of their beak, it's like, I'm not, I'm not that big. But their, their beaks are so large that they don't even close. Like they're perpetually open. And uh, this is his favorite spot here. And he might, he might make some pops and whistles for us. He gets pretty excited. Now these are the birds that people see in videos where they, they drum on hollow logs, but they only do that in Australia. They don't do that in populations in Indonesia. And they make little, little funny calls and he does have an ear splitting sort of laser call. Uh, they do have a really specialized diet. So they need like really specialized care. And they have, here we go. They have, 
<laughs> they have such strong beaks that they can destroy pretty much anything. Like there's a lot in my household that like uh, an entire couch that between them and the dogs, they have completely destroyed and uh, remote controls, lamps, tables, you, I mean, dishes, you name it, this, this guy can destroy it and, and has destroyed it. So um, it's pretty. And there is no way to keep him from doing that. There's no way to train him, for lack of a better word, to keep from destroying these right. things. Right. I mean, they have tons of enrichment that it's like, this is the good stuff. But a lot of times the really fun stuff is actually your cabinetry. Right. Or your, you know, your baseboards, your, you know, the things that is designed to be a little bit harder to, to remodel. And he's like, yeah, that, that's what I want. So they, they do have plenty of toys, but it's usually the, the 80 to, <coughs> yeah, there we go. The $1,000 toys that they really like. Well, the naughtier, the mm -hmm. more fun it is. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend who has one that uh, literally has gone through $1,500 remote controls Jeez. each month, if not more. Jeez. All right, so there is a reason why these are one of my favorite cockatoos. They are just the most beautiful. That head crest is amazing. It's like they have a head of fire. These are the Major Mitchell cockatoos, probably my favorite parrot as well. They're absolutely stunningly beautiful. Uh, they're two sisters and it's Roxy over uh, looking at you with the crest and then Daisy May is uh, checking us out and they are absolutely beautiful. They're the buzzsaws of, of the parrot world. They uh, just go through toys, branches, wood blocks like crazy. So they really, really can destroy a lot. And one of the things that we get, I would say a lot with cockatoos, um, we do a lot of uh, parrot behavior consulting and uh, design courses for people to actually really help out with parrots because they can be so complicated and they're really social and very intelligent is like sexual behavior and you know, territoriality, defensive uh, behavior, especially when a parrot really has a close bond with one person in the home, that's kind of a big one. Right. It's like, you know, what do I do when this parrot loves me, has a strong bond with me, and attacks my husband or my other, my significant other, maybe even the children in the home, and, and what can I do? So there's a couple of things that we look at, first to kind of manage the environment and help kind of bring down that parrot's just kind of general sense of like, hey, it's time for me to create a nest because that's when they really start looking at those pair bonds and be like, hey, kind of come come with me with this little hidey hole. So we look at fats and sugars in the diet because they are seasonal usually. And that really tells the parrot like it's time to get really, really nesty. So fats and sugars are the big one. And then also creating hidey holes. You can see like our aviaries are very open when we don't have those little tents and those corners that they can get really nesty in. And that's kind of the big one. A lot of parrots like African greys, like for some reason, African greys love bathrooms and they'll kind of defend like the toilet area is really common. Uh, just just avoid it, you know? Uh, Eclectus parrots are, are really, really bad at finding nests year round. That is their job. They're polyamorous. Uh, who isn't these days? Mm -hmm, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But uh, but they they that is their job is to, to mate with as many, as many different ones as they possibly can. And so, um, and so it's really important to to really avoid letting them nest and and then letting the the problem person so the person who that parrot has decided is kind of en enemy numero uno be the person to be the deliverer of the the treats the goodies and the the favorite person can kind of take a back seat and just not do what we call heavy petting so cockatoos love love like full body pets and that's just not something that's good for like sustainable relationship building for a lot of different people so we don't do a lot of a lot of heavy petting right yeah we we might do a couple next scritches but not that kind of like full-on like what you would pet your dog or cat right, right it's just not healthy so those are kind of our our big ones that we look for and then if you have a really big problem find someone who is like a, a top-notch animal behaviorist, you know, what certifications help, but sometimes like I'm not certified, I've been doing this for 20 years, um, but someone who's science-based, you know, asking a hive mind for help isn't always helpful. Finding, you know, uh, just just someone who's really, really good at what they do and getting that really mono -e mono uh, help. There's, there's lots of different behaviorists out there that can help. So how do you keep a parrot 
from nesting if that's its natural instinct. So uh, we we really look for preventative opportunities. So we just keep the door shut, right? When the African Grey is out, just don't let them go into the bathroom. We don't give them those tents. We don't give them material that they can create like little nests out of. And if your parrot is spending a lot of time on the bottom of the cage, then find some way of not giving it like real, like, shreddable material and it's really obvious what your parrot loves our our parrots all have kind of their special materials that they really really like and certain times of the year they just don't get it right you can also manage the photo period so certain parrots have different photo periods that mean it's time to nest there's not any one kind of photo period that uh that means like okay this parrot needs 12 hours of sleep a day and this parrot needs 15 hours of sleep they're all different and you can kind of do your research uh we have all kinds of different classes where we help people figure that out for their parrots. So um, it's it's just about doing some 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 scientific looks. Doesn't take doesn't take too much to figure it out and it really helps just removing the materials removing the opportunities y you might feel like a little inconvenienced but it's a whole lot easier than having your ankles bloodied and your spouse get gets upset like everyone deserves to be comfortable in their own home and getting getting them on your team on team parrot is is helpful so that they aren't you know put out all right so one of the things that everybody loves about parrot behavior is how comical they can be yeah. and how much they can play and really make us laugh. Yeah. This guy is no different. In fact, what he loves to do is mess with my dogs. Mm -hmm. So what he will do is he will like drop pine cones on them from above uh -huh. and then like peek over and watch to see if it hit or what the dog's reaction is. And that is honestly like what they do to us, right? I said like they push that button and then like see what happens. So it is really funny and they're just like that all the time. So like he just is such a ham and he know like he laughs like different people. So he laughs like me, he laughs like my partner Andre, like he laughs like all kinds of different people and he sort of knows the context. And because I have a camera in his face, he's just silent and yeah, exactly. not illustrating any of that. Nope, nope. <laughs> Hi Harry. Look at your fat little tummy. Are you gonna here, let's see if I can get him to Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> of course. Of course. So guys, I just want to give a real quick thank you to everyone here at Avian Behavior International for sharing all their knowledge, not only on the Birds of Prey from another video, but on parrot behavior as well. So I'm going to put all of their links in the description below. Go check them out. And guys, as always, thanks for watching. And until the next animal adventure, love the planet and rattle on. <laughs>